So it's a, it's a real pleasure to give this lecture um, and acknowledge uh, Bill Steubing. Um, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, it's also a daunting topic, but I chose it. So um, uh, I'm going to try to raise the question. Um, and hopefully, all of us in the room will try to help each other answer the question. But of course, it's a question that's very relevant. Um, this morning, someone asked me what I did this morning. I'm a stem cell biologist. Um, I'm a cancer geneticist. I do transplants. I transplant blood stem cells into human beings. Uh, this morning, uh, we just looked at our, we have a morning uh, laboratory rounds, and uh, we were looking through last week's data um, and realized that we uh, had been using cord blood stem cells, stem cells coming from uh, umbilical cord blood. Um, and uh, we're now getting routinely 90% uh, genetic changes, deliberate genetic changes in cord blood stem cells. Uh, it was unimaginable six months ago. It was unimaginable 12 months ago to get an efficiency of genetic, uh, to engineer human cord blood stem cells with efficiencies that range in the 90 to 95% range, changing a genetic, changing a gene of interest um, in treating. And remember, these are human cord blood. This is not a mouse experiment. These are human cord blood stem cells. If we were to implant these into human beings, they would engraft, they would give rise to the entire system of human blood, um, getting these numbers without exogenous agents, without viruses, are truly surprising and, and raise fundamental questions about where this technology is going. So I in some ways, my day comes through a very weird circle. I wake up in the morning, go to the laboratory, see patients, and in the evening, I get to think about the things that I haven't thought about during the day, which is, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> where, where are we going with all of this? Um, and, and when, what are the landmarks? What are the boundaries? What does this nation look like um, in which uh, an unusual number of technologies that are converging on our ability to change human genomes. So uh, that's, that's my introduction. I, I, I'm not here to give a biology lecture. Um, so by means of introduction, we just need some vocabulary. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction. Um, but really, uh, the, there's, a, there's a much wider, deeper field here, which I'm, I'm, I'm not going to belabor. But, but the field. Uh, in some ways, in a sense, starts with uh, starts here, uh, in in the Czech Republic. This is uh, in a city called Brno. Um, how many of you have been to Brno? One, two, three, five people. Uh, yeah. So this is where I would make the argument that this is where biology, modern biology, begins. In fact, it begins right here in this little garden, about the size of this, uh, the full full edge of the stage over here, uh, which is planted. Uh, peculiarly with gardenias, when in fact uh, several years ago, several hundred years ago, it was planted with peas. And here, um, this window over here, this one, is the window that we know that uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, this is the room that Gregor Mendel inhabited. And here in this garden, he planted his first set of peas. Now people often ask, and there's a great deep, there's, there's a lot of history over here which I'm glossing through, people often ask, well, what about Mendel? Um, was so important, so revolutionary, and there are many, many things. We know the idea that ultimately Mendel came to, the idea that there are particulate factors, there are factors that move across generations, not losing themselves, not losing information, but being carried in their wholeness um, that, uh, that Mendel really found. But really, Mendel's, one of the things that I, I write about in the book is that Really, Mendel's genius was to mix two disciplines. He mixed mathematics and biology. People didn't think about biologic, biology mathematically. They thought about biology anatomically. They thought about biology physiologically. Mendel was one of the first to think about biology as an abstract problem in mathematics. Are there, are there ratios? Are there rhythms? Are there fundamental constancies that ride through the, the inheritance of heredity? Now, it's amazing in retrospect that we think about heredity this way, because the dominant feeling, the dominant idea about what, what heredity was, um, was, was an idea that we had, was, is a very intuitive idea, but an idea that we inherited uh, 
from generations past, which is that, you know, your, your nose looks like some kind of blend between your mother's nose and your father's nose. Your hair, the color of your hair looks, some kind of, looks like some kind of blend between your father's hair and your mother's hair, your height, and so on and so forth. So intuitively, it made a lot of sense that you were the product, some kind of wearing blender product of your, of your two parents, of your father and, and your mother. And this theory was a powerful theory and it really had stood the test of time across many thousands of years before, as I said, Mendel began to apply mathematical rules to very simple ways. Now, the problem is, if you think about it, it cannot possibly be true. Because if that was true, how would you explain gender? If in every generation, the, the two features, the anatomical physiological features of your father and your mother mixed together, then how on earth would you explain the physiological dichotomy, the, the bifurcation of the anatomy and physiology? It just couldn't possibly be true. There had to be unitary characteristics moving across generations. And it's an amazing thing if you think about that. It just takes you one second to take commonplace ideas in history to figure out that an incredibly important field could be based on conjecture and would be wrong. And you could disprove it just based on one simple idea. And that, of course, was what Mendel did. He took an entire field of history, philosophy, um, biology, uh, by fusing it and looking at mathematics and began to understand, as I said, that genes are carried in, in unitary forms that really, he, although he didn't use the word, there's information that's moving in from one generation to the other, and it doesn't get blended. It really remains constant. Um, and this is, of course, as Mendel himself, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reminder to people who pra practice um, uh, in the academy that Mendel really virtually failed every examination uh, that he ever took. Um, so much so that he wasn't allowed to, to really be a teacher. He could only be a substitute teacher. Um, and, um, and later in his life, so that, that's one reminder. And the second great reminder is that later in his life, the, the only scientific work that he ever did, the only important work that he ever did, was uh, in, in publishing his important paper on peas. Uh, it, was read by, it was read by about, we think, about 100 odd people, and then basically vanished for 40 odd years. No one even heard of it, talked about it, referred to it. And his later life was uh, taken up with administrative responsibilities, and he never produced another piece of work in his life. So um, it's, it's a kind of moral warning for people who, who, enter, who leave the academy to do administrative work. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, it's an important feature of the gene that the idea of genetic manipulation and genetic perfectibility occurs not as a consequence of what Mendel does or discovers, but occurs in parallel with what Mendel does and discovers. In other words, the desire to perfect human beings through genetic means, through the means of controlling heredity, is an ancient desire. It's a desire that predates Mendel and continues beyond Mendel. What's interesting about it, and we'll talk about this in greater detail, Mendel and the idea of the, the existence of the gene provides a critical piece in this because he, he, he and subsequently others, once, once, we, reali once we realize and, and fully digest the idea that the gene is, a, is, a, is, is carried in a particulate form, that the information does not get destroyed, you also have to accept that these individual pieces, these units, as it were, could be individually manipulated. Now, I, I, I want to emphasize how important that is. Because if, if the whole thing was a kind of wearing blender miasma of, of, of features blending with each other, our capacity in 2017 to intervene on one aspect of it, leaving the rest of it untouched, would be greatly compromised. We would, we would be stuck saying, God, you know, if we, if we touch the gene that controls um, a terrifying form of cardiac disease, um, and this was the re reference made earlier, what if we also mess up the genes that control physiology, uh, the development of the brain, the fact that we have five fingers? 
But in fact, it is the, it is the very idea that the, um, that the gene occurs as a unitary object, a unitary uh, uh, a part of, of a material chemical that allows us in 2017 to make, to, to imagine intervening on the human genome in a way that would be otherwise unimaginable if the gene was mixed up in a way in this wearing blender way. So both these things are simultaneously true. It is simultaneously true that the desire for human perfectibility arises before modern genetics. But it's also true that modern genetics allows us to bring to completion uh, the idea of human perfectibility in a way that wouldn't be possible had old ideas of genes uh, 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 continued to exist. If there's one point about this talk that I want to emphasize, it's that both these things are true, that there is both an ancient desire for human perfectibility and modern technologies have allowed us to take those ancient desires and bring them to a technological place which would not otherwise be possible was it not the case that genes were arranged this way? We'll talk more about this as we move along. Um, but, but going back to this ancient desire, in fact, long after Mendel, Mendel was rediscovered uh, in the 1910s and 1920s, having been forgotten since the 1860s, um, but, the, but the idea of human perfectibility uh, was racing along in the 10s and 20s on its own accord. This is. Um, uh, uh, a picture of a Nazi scientist measuring the height of, t of twins, uh, trying to understand the extent to which height is determined by genetic influences versus environmental or nutrient influences. Um, this, is a, this is one of the interesting pictures from uh, the archives, which is in the book. Uh, this is another, uh, this is a, 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 a picture from a Nazi training camp. Uh, you can see the uh, swastika on this man's uh, armband. Um, and this would be a typical picture. I mean, it, it, it took uh, a particularly uh, astute intern to find this. This would be a typical picture. It, was, it, it came on my, on my desk, except, of course, if you look very close by, here is the teacher teaching Mendelian genetics. Uh, you can see these little lines. This would be a family history um, uh, being taught as part of the education of a young, uh, of a young Nazi recruit. Um, but this, of course, was not only a Nazi problem. This was not a German problem. It is one of the, um, it is one of the, our attempts to airbrush history, to rem to try to remind ourselves that eugenics, the idea of human perfectibility, was something that was invented and created in the nineteen, the late nineteen thirties in Germany. But of course, that's not true. The idea of eugenics was born um, out of a very liberal. Um, uh, a Victorian or post-Victorian ethos, uh, Francis Galton, who, who, co who conjured the name eugenics, the uh, eugenics, better humans, a better heredity, um, was, uh, was part of the, uh, of the great Victorian, post-Victorian elite who thought of himself as a great, as someone who was doing humankind an enormous favor by helping us. And, and Galton's idea was that if you bred people if you bred the right kind of people at the right times, a kind of numerological uh, eugenics, you would get better human beings. And it was a social function. It was, in fact, a state-mandated function that you should do this. And this was the only way that we would get a more perfectible human race, and we would eliminate terrifying diseases, including mental illnesses. So Galton's idea of eugenics was a, an idea of selection, but through better breeding. This was a, what, he called, what he called and what others later called positive eugenics. Um, but even then, so this was in the early 1900s, late 1800s and early 1900s, the idea began to s circulate. And, and if you were, if, if an audience like this, if you were part of you know, the Bloomsbury elite, as it were, or what would later become the Bloomsbury elite, um, you would find yourself agreeing with Galton. You would say this is one of the ways that a state should exert its influence, um, a country should exert its influence and make human beings better. Um, but even then, that idea doesn't get to Nazi Germany. There's an intermediate period, what I call the adolescence of eugenics, and that, of course, is in the United States. It's a history we've effectively buried, um, but, but, but is now emerging um, as, as a powerful moment in our history. Um, it begins, um, among other things, with uh, the, these Better Babies contests. Um, 
This is a picture of, of uh, uh, kids being, and there's a physician here and a nurse um, judging two nurses, three nurses, uh, better babies to, um, uh, to determine who are the best babies for future uh, selection, future representation. Um, it takes form in, of, uh, in these advertisements that come out in, the, in popular newspapers, in films, in magazines. This is the, the, the tree of eugenics. Uh, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. Um, uh, and it has all sorts of lovely things like biology, genetics, anthropology, statistics, medicine, etc., converging. Uh, like roots of a tree, allowing human beings to become, you know, the branches that are that are improved based on these these roots that are collected. Uh, my book, the gene, is dedicated to Carrie Buck. Um, this is Carrie Buck. Um, Carrie Buck is really the uh, the, the 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 person that uh, crystallizes these, these ideas in its most macabre form. Uh, Carrie Buck is is deemed to be a a genetic imbecile. Um, and uh, the, the court mandates that she be sterilized uh, in order to prevent her from having any more children as a consequence of genetic imbecility. We now know and we suspect that that is likely all nonsense, that in fact Carrie Buck had no genetic imbecility. She was a rebel. She, was, uh, she lived outside the, the norms of, of, then, of society. But this is her with her mother, Emma Buck, who was also, and both of them were confined. Um, in a state uh, held, uh, uh, I would now call it a prison, but it was then called a sanatorium, uh, uh, and, and Carrie Buck appealed her case. She, she appealed her, her, uh, the state's capacity to sterilize her by removing her ovaries, and she lost the case. Um, and the final judgment that was handed down by no, none other than Oliver Wendell Holmes was three generations of imbeciles is enough. Um, that word enough um, uh, is a word that should send a chill up everyone's spines. What is enough? Um, where does enough start and end? But nonetheless, Carrie Buck was taken to a uh, surgical suite against her will. Um, her uh, belly was cut open, and a surgeon was allowed by state mandate to remove her two ovaries so that she would never have another child again. Um, I'm going to take a, a swerve away from this, um, far away from this, um, and talk about the scientific events that happened uh, in between so that we can then get to the substance of the conversation, which is with that history, with that back story uh, lurking behind us, uh, what do we do now? What happens next? This is really meant to be a, a rapid fire scientific journey. You can read in great, great, great detail about it in the gene, so I won't spend a lot of time. But of course, by the 1950s, uh, we returned to the idea. While the idea, while the idea of human perfectibility was advancing, we did return to the idea of, well, what is a gene? What is it made of? Is it a chemical? What kind of chemical is it? And if it's a chemical, can we make changes in it? Um, if we make changes, then what kind of changes should we be able to make? Um, uh, that's, a, that's, again, a long legacy. This is, um, it, it, there's a structure uh, component to this. What is the structure of that chemical? What is the function of that chemical? What does it do? Um, and because it's a chemical, can we change it? Um, can we change its, uh, the, its chemical nature and thereby change the heredity, the her hereditary information that's passed around? So um, this is uh, Rosalind Franklin. Um, uh, I, I put this picture in because uh, this was this is this uh, X-ray uh, uh, crystallogram has some, sometimes been described as the most beautiful picture ever taken in biology. Of course, it is a picture of the structure of DNA, um, and Rosalind was among the first to um, to take one of these pictures. This is, of course, photograph 51, and I, I put this in because we just finished the Nobel Prize um, season. And Rosalind sadly would, died of cancer um, before she uh, could even be nominated for the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Um, but the winners of that prize, of course, uh, were Francis Crick and, and Jim Watson. And this is the structure of DNA. And there's some historical debate about the extent to which they used Rosalind's data um, to, to, make this, uh, to make this structure. Nonetheless, uh, uh, Jim Watson and Francis Crick uh, were able to solve that structure 
uh, of DNA, and this is in fact their first uh, in in their Cambridge laboratory as as young men, as you can see, them attempting to build a stick and uh, a ball and stick model of that structure of DNA. And that structure of DNA, as now you many of you know, is extraordinarily simple. Now that's important. The extraordinary simplicity was unanticipated. Uh, it's an extraordinarily simple structure, and it carries its code, the code that makes you and me, our anatomy, our physiology, really in four cardinal molecules, um, uh, which are then bound together in a chain, uh, one chain having a, you know, a reading A, C, A, G, C, A, G, T, and its reverse complements it, its mirror image reading A, C, T, G, C, T, G. Again, uh, this is most of you who are biologists or in medicine know this very well. I won't press the point, but if you're not in the field, uh, the important piece, uh, the important thing to remember is that these two things, these two strands, are really complements of each other. They're mirror images of each other, and they're twined around each other in a double, in the famous double helix. And the information to build um, a, an organism out of an embryo, the information to carry out the physiology of the embryo is all carried in this, um, in this spool of molecules in, a, in four letters, A, C, T, G. So that if I took your genome, which would be three billion odd letters of this A, C, T, G, you actually get three billion from two pairs, but three billion odd letters of this A, C, T, G, and I would print it out in a standard in a standard printed format, just one person's genome, it would be 72 full sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So you can imagine one set, but 75 or 72 full sets. And if you opened one page, you know, set 16, volume 35, page 342, it would read A, C, T, G, C, G, T, 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 C, G, and so forth. That's not real. I, I didn't memorize it, but, <laughs> but I'm just making it up. But but that would but that sequence from that encyclopedia, we now know that from that encyclopedia, a single cell can build a multicellular organism with all its complexities um, and all its many many dimensional physiologies. So the question is, well, how does it do it? How does it do that? Now, that's a, there's a long story there. Again, I'm, I'm summarizing. This will seem obvious to most people who are in the field in medicine and biology. Uh, however, um, again, just to get the vocabulary clear, um, between the 1950s and the 1960s, um, the important realization was that genes uh, uh, make messages, uh, these messages uh, themselves uh, have aspects of form and function, or they can be further translated into aspects of form and function. Um, and we know the chemical versions of these. This is the gene is carried in the form of DNA uh, that gets uh, uh, that gets uh, a copy of that or a, or a variant of that gets made into RNA. Itself has some functions, but ultimately gives rise to proteins. And Again, uh, those, the, the differences in th uh, this function, this output, uh, combined with differences in environments, nutrition, life, fate, things that we call, uh, things that we used to think of as very abstract, give rise to a person that looks like this versus a person who looks like this. Um, this is a one basis of the difference but there are multiple bases of the differences. Uh, but, but this is an important basis of the difference. Um, we, uh, scientists then figured out the, the, the nature of the code. This is not a code that is hidden to us. We now know exactly what this code looks like, what, what the code between RNA and protein looks like. This is Marshall Nirenberg in his laboratory. And this is, in fact, I know Myrna Weissman, who is Marshall's surviving um, uh, wife. Uh, but um, this is from, this is a courtesy of Myrna. This is Marshall's first, um, this is a picture I took. This is Marshall's first uh, uh, deciphering of the, of the genetic code from his notebook. Uh, one last aspect of this is to remind ourselves is that the genome is not a static entity. Um, the, the genome, as I said, just to remind ourselves of the analogy of the metaphor here is that your genome would be uh, in every single cell would be uh, a room full of these Encyclopedia Britannicas. Uh, 
But one cell, your, the cell in your brain, uses only one of them, only, only some of those pages, only reads some of those pages. A different cell in your body, a blood cell, reads other pages. And by reading different pages off the, by reading out different pages off that static encyclopedia, your body can generate very, very different functions. It can generate very different responses to events and so forth. And of course, the, the most striking example of this is that this creature has exactly the same genome as this creature. They both have exactly the same genome, and yet the output of the genome produces a, 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 an insect that looks like this versus another insect that looks like this and has wings. Uh, if you were, both of them have exactly the same encyclopedia, but the, but the way that the encyclopedia is read, the selective reading of some pages allows one insect to look like this, another stage to look like this, and yet another stage to look like this. So there's a dynamism in, in, in genetic information that's important. So that brings us really to the edge of what, 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 wh where we are today and, and what we have to discuss today, which is um, w w now we're beginning to read and write the genetic code. So until this point of time, until the 1950s, we'd begun to understand it. But the moral dimension, the ethical dimension, the bioethical consequences of what happens really begin from the 1950s onwards, which is when, now having understood the background, we begin to actively read our code. This is Fred Sanger, who uh, was one of the first to develop a mechanism to read genetic instruction. So instead of that encyclopedia being in the abstract, you all of a sudden could enumerate, you could actually say, on page 347, the sequence reads A, C, T, G, G, C, T, C, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and here's another picture of, um, I think, what, what, concentrate on the blackboard for a second. This is Bob Swanson, her Boyer. But, um, but on the blackboard, concentrate on the idea that in, in, initially in bacteria, but eventually in all organisms, we could take pieces of genetic code, pieces of genes, genes as chemicals, and, and move them around from one organism to another. So rather than, again, this being a code or a chemical that was somehow trapped in nature. Your encyclopedia is your encyclopedia, mine is my encyclopedia, never the twain can be switched, changed, altered. We began to understand that at least in simple organisms, you could take a page out from one of these, um, from the encyclopedia of a yeast cell and put it in the encyclopedia of a whale cell, just to give you a, a, a somewhat absurd example, but it would be red because it's the same kind of chemical and the processes, because of evolution, the processes remain constant. That's a, the, you might say in 2017, that doesn't surprise you very much. Of course, this was extraordinarily surprising when it occurred. And in the blackboard, you know, this is the, this is the basis of that moment on the blackboard. Here they are um, taking a gene from a bacterium and splicing it um, or putting it really into the gene, in genome of a virus. And it just the simple arrow, this of course took decades of work, but this simple arrow uh, suggests that you could just mix and match these. You could tear out one page and put it into another page and it would be read as if the encyclopedia was intact. This moment did not get unnoticed. Um, uh, <laughs> the idea of human perfectibility and it's alternative, the idea that you could also have um, human beings that were genetically altered. Uh, because if, you know, if, so this is in the 1960s and 1970s, technology is far away from this, but the fear um, really begins to resonate. Um, and again, I, I just remind myself there was a, a massive conference held at Azilomar, uh, I write about this, uh, where a, a large group of, uh, uh, scholars, intellectuals, journalists, lawyers, um, it, it was a public conference, came together to ask the question, okay, we're, this is in, 19, in, the, in the 1970s, to ask the question, okay, we've invented these technologies, it's, you know, we're starting to read the human genome, we're starting to move, swap genetic elements between, um, between organisms, what should we do? Uh, our, should we stop? Should we put a moratorium on this capacity? Um, students uh, protested uh, remembering what had happened um, from the 1930s, this is in Cambridge, at a conference, a conference interrupted, we will create the perfect race, 
Um, this is Paul Berg, my mentor at Stanford. I still very close friends with him. Uh, one of the inventors of this technology, um, worrying in this room in Azilomar about what would happen. Um, but what's interesting about it is that most of that meeting, uh, because of technical and technological reasons, most of that meeting was concentrated on the possibility of biological crisis or biological catastrophe. So it was, a, it was really, Azilomar ultimately became a biosafety meeting. It did not become a moral safety meeting. Of course, biosafety is moral safety. There are connections between them. But by moral safety, I mean what do we do about human beings? What do we do about the future of human beings? Paul and I had a conversation six months ago, and we'll repeat it, in San Francisco, where I asked him on stage. I said, well, Paul, why? What was the thought behind that? Why did, why did it become? Why was, the, uh, why was it that the, that, that the biological dangers, the, the, the biohazard, took precedent over moral hazard? Um, and the answer was they, had, they really did not think in, in the 1970s that this was real, that, that, that there is any way that, sorry, that the scenario of intervening, intervening of human genomes in an, in an embryo and thereby changing human genomes prospectively was even conceivable. It, it was technologically outside the realm of thinking. So fast forward again, and now we come to the, to the sort of the final phase, the, the phase that we're living in now. And that begins in 2001, and that begins with the, the draft sequence of the human genome. So now, by 2001, the, this is Fred Sanger again. This is an older uh, Fred Sanger um, who began to uh, show us ways to sequence the human genome. But by 2001, we had a draft sequence of the human genome, not the entirety. But for the most part, the, that encyclopedia that I had referred to, um, the ACTG, CCTG, et cetera, was, was known, was a finite. We knew what lived on, uh, as I said, page 347 uh, in volume 335. Um, and that was published in Nature and in Science. Um, and of course, as many of you know, people who work in the field, it's publicly accessible. You can go and download it. You can open it up. You can look at not your own genome, but the draft sequence of, of, of some human genomes is fully known. Um, you can log into it. You can find uh, what gene lives on uh, where on that, on that, uh, on various uh, chromosomes of the human body. Um, so this was the first real act of reading the human genome. So, and by reading, I mean knowing the letters, the ACTG letters that constitute the encyclopedia. But of course, there's a second phase of reading, which is ascribing meaning. We don't read just by uh, acknowledging letters. That's the first thing we teach our children when we teach them to read. This letter refers to this sound, that letter refers to that sound. But the meaning that lies behind reading occurs when you begin to take that information and transform that into meaning. And that meaning has now, we are beginning to, to, to really access the meaning of those ACTGs. That project is far from complete. But every day, we begin to understand deeper and deeper meaning behind that sequence of inscrutable seeming letters. So what do we know? What do we know so far? What are the general principles of this reading capacity? Well, one thing that we know is that most human genes are controlled by multiple, most human traits are controlled by multiple genes. Um, height is a great example. Uh, human height, uh, we now know that is controlled, the variation, the, the normal human variation in height is controlled by dozens of genes. Um, and, by, and conversely, and perhaps relatedly, uh, most human diseases are similarly polygenic. Uh, the most common human diseases are polygenic. Um, one important feature is that many, and by many I refer both to traits and to diseases, have genetic links, but the exact genes are unknown. There are obviously outliers in this. Huntington's disease, there's one gene, and it's extraordinarily powerful in determining if it's, in, if it's one variant. The chances that you will live and die of Huntington's disease are virtually 100%. Um, cystic fibrosis is another example uh, in which if you, if you happen to inherit uh, 
two mut mutant copies of that gene, chances that you will have a cystic fibrosis-like disease, whether it's a mild version or it's a very severe version, are nearly 100%. Um, we also have learned, and we, I referred to this idea before, it's an, it's an important realization, that genes, although they are dominant uh, influence on our lives, intersect or they are information readers, they compile information, and compile information from environment and chance. Um, now, this statement sounds like a bland truth, genes plus environment plus chance equals phenotype traits, features. It's not a bland truth at all. It is, in fact, the central truth that many of us are living. And one of the huge projects of genomics right now is to ascribe feature for feature the role of gene, environment, and chance in determining phenotype. And that is an incredibly important project. Um, and so as a consequence, because of all this I said, because most human genes are controlled by multiple genes, most human diseases are polygenic, um, a genetic report card will give, you, give us propensities, but it will not give us um, actualities. So rather than, uh, rather than there being, uh, you know, again, to give you an example, Huntington's disease is it, the, the chances if you, if you inherit the uh, mutant version of the Huntington's disease gene, gene the chances that you will have a, um, uh, the disease in your lifetime are 100%. In contrast, for most human diseases, we now know most human traits, it is rather a, a, a set of propensities rather than a, a, a definite uh, a feature of, of your future. That was, uh, this I call safe zones genetics. Uh, these were general principles that were true. We knew human diseases and human traits were multiple genes that were polygenic, but the exact genes were not known. Um, but in the last five odd years, so if you think about, again, reading and writing, reading genes and writing genes, reading being the capacity to decipher information from the genome, writing referring to the capacity to intervene and make deliberate changes in the genome, both of these technologies are changing. And that's really where we are today. So I'll give you one example of something that happened last week. This is a paper published last week um, in which the authors use genetic information alone to predict human height. Um, so on the x-axis is the predicted height based on genetic information. On the y-axis is actual height based on genetic information. And the trick to this paper was to unleash deep learning on the human genome. So this is about several hundred thousand, so 2,000 individuals. This is now being generalized to 500,000 individuals on a biobank. And human beings, human eyes, our intelligence, our standard ways of thinking about the world are not sufficient to predict height. It's too complicated. That was very safe because we could say, God, you know, we understand that height has a strong genetic and heritable uh, quality. Identical twins tend to be the same height, uh, particularly in the West where, the, where nutritional status is equalized. Uh, if they don't have diseases and so forth, if there's no great environmental influence, if there's no accident or, or change in nature. So we lived in a relatively safe zone, and that was a zone of ignorance. We said, we cannot predict this. It's too complicated. We just opened, about 10 or 20 days ago, we opened a new box there by saying, okay, maybe human beings can't predict it, but what if deep learning, uh, computational techniques could predict it? And in fact, this is deep learning on 2,000 individuals. This R value, people who are statisticians will know this, is 0 0.64. It's not great, but it's not bad either. Um, and we think, based I spoke to the author of the paper, we think the, 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 the accuracy is within 0 0.6 centimeters. So in other words, forget about asking anything about family history, forget about asking anything about the individual. This just takes the sequence of a genome and using deep learning techniques spits out your predicted height, and you get to about 0.6 centimeters of, the, of real height. Um, this is morally complex universe, um, because if we were to be able to predict this for unborn children, um, in societies where height carries a premium, uh, if we were to generalize this across other polygenic diseases, remember we were in a safe zone, we said, 
it's too complicated, we can leave it all alone because it lies in some kind of weird black box. We just put the black, we just opened the black box and inserted it into the human genome. There are skeptics who will say this is an unusual situation, you know, height is very heritable, absolutely correct. Others will say, okay, but what if, you know, what if you get to close enough with other things? What if you get to the risk of cancer? Uh, what if you get to the risk of Alzheimer's disease? What if you get the risk of neurological diseases? On one hand, diabetes. On one hand, you can imagine a new kind of medicine that would be born out of that. Um, powerful ways to interrogate human beings, predict people's futures. On the other hand, um, what if this enters territory like height? Um, what if it enters the territory of IQ, whatever it, that measures? What if it enters um, a sexual orientation? Um, we have just stepped uh, using new um, arenas into territory that we, what we thought was so complicated that we would leave it on its side. Now, this is of course just the reading part. Right, so this is just what's happening in reading. Um, so just to finish, finish, summarize that arena, it, obviously these points should be, to, should be evident to everyone. This has consequences for virtually every human disease. It has consequences for health maintenance, surveillance, and risk. It has consequences for insurance and risk, uh, risk sharing. People often ask me, well, what about insurance? And I say, well, insurance is a mechanism for risk sharing if, you have, if you're ignorant about risk. You can't have insurance when you are not ignorant, ignorant about risk. If all of a sudden we are all to be non-ignorant about risk, we would not be able to share risk anymore. So the standard mechanisms that we have insurance um, would be challenged. Um, on a side note, this are, these are my, I'm revealing my personal political proclivities. I cannot think of a more strong argument for universal basic health insurance um, that in fact uh, one of the consequences of, uh, of, of the deeper interrogation of human genetics has to be that we have to radically equalize ourselves when we realize that in fact we're radically unequal. There's no other consequence. Um, so that, that is the, the so-called reading part of the human genome and then I'll move on to the writing part and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, uh, I'll read a section of the book where, where all this is addressed. So while we're reading, we're also doing something called writing, and by writing I mean changing uh, the actual code itself. So if reading involves going to the encyclopedia and deciphering the nature of information, writing involves going to page 347 and volume 16 and erasing a particular set of ACTG and replacing it with a different, uh, different code. Um, this is a, um, an article that I wrote for uh, uh, a magazine, which I would encourage you to read about uh, BRCA1, the gene that increases risk for breast cancer. Um, here's a picture of, there are several people involved in this. Um, uh, there are patents and cross patents and lawsuits going on about who owns this technology. I'm not gonna enter that. But anyway, this is Jennifer Dowd. I'm doing a talk with Jennifer uh, in January. Um, and her, uh, uh, a woman who uh, is, is her lab manager. But Jennifer, of course, as many of you very well know, is one of the leaders in inventing technologies to allow us to change, to make deliberate changes in human genomes. This is a cartoon. Um, I have to remind ourselves that this is, the, this is not one technology, this is a suite of technologies. Um, people somehow have become obsessed with one enzyme, one gene, Cas9, CRISPR, et cetera. But CRISPR and Cas9 are really a suite of technologies uh, that allow us to begin to think about making deliberate changes in the human genome. Um, and here's one provocative kind of deliberate change that you might want to make on the human genome. Um, this is obviously a cartoon, but to delete um, from a embryonic cell or an embryonic stem cell or a sperm cell the BRCA1 gene mutation that increases your risk for breast cancer. Um, um, the, 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 the part of the point um, that, uh, that I'm trying to make is, is this idea of a suite of technologies. CRISPR and Cas9 are one element of a, of a kind of um, array of technologies that are allowing us to circulate closer and closer and closer to making deliberate, human, deliberate changes in the genomes of humans 
and in the genomes of other organisms. And, and the, the, the fact is that these technologies will only enrich themselves and deepen themselves with the other two things that I talked about, the writing, the reading, and, the, and, the, and, and, and deep learning techniques that we understand. So the more we read, and again, remind us of it's like a child. The more the child reads, the more the child understands, the more the child learns to write himself or herself. And all of a sudden, if you see, the, see this in your own children, they go through a transitional phase when all of a sudden language, the language that we communicate with, becomes, uh, uh, becomes uh, fundamentally uh, uh, amenable to their own, own manipulation. And I, I really like to press this analogy. It's not as if we're just reading or just writing or just, uh, uh, or just learning. It's the fact that these three things are converging together, allowing us to learn the language of genetics and genomics and becoming more and more facile with using them. Um, a couple more slides. Um, one is um, that, again, to emphasize these, these kind of suite of technologies, here is a cross-section of a, 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 a culture, cell culture, in which um, uh, cells uh, that have been genetically modified are being persuaded using techniques to become other cells. And if you look closely, you might identify what this cell is. This is a sperm cell. So this, these are primordial um, germline cells, germline stem cells, which are being persuaded to make sperm cells. And it, again, does not take a, uh, much to understand that you can make changes in these cells, in the cells that produce sperm and eggs, and ultimately, if you make changes in those cells, the genetic changes that you're making will ultimately become changes in sperm, obviously. And once they become changes in sperm, they can there be, therefore be transmitted not across one generation, but across multiple generations. So the contrast is with the example that I gave you at the beginning of the talk, which is in my laboratory, we work on blood stem cells. Blood stem cells, if you make genetic changes in blood stem cells, those cells remain in the person's body, often for the lifetime of that person, but when that person generates another human being, they don't get transmitted, so they're restricted to that human being's body. On the other hand, if you were to make changes in these cells, these primordial germ cells, then those changes would become permanently imprinted in every single cell of the person that's born, because the sperm would give rise to every single cell of the person that's born, bar a few exceptions, but also then become the sperm, become part of the sperm and the eggs of that human being by definition. And therefore, the changes that you would make would be permanently imprinted on the human genome. Um, and the final possibility, of course, is that we're getting to a place as part of this suite of technologies where we're saying, God, you know, why make all these changes? I like what I just said, God. But um, <laughs> why make all of these changes in... Um, in a, gene, in a genome that already exists, why not make the whole thing from scratch? It's a chemical. You can string them together from scratch. Why don't we make larger and larger pieces of DNA? Why don't we get to the place of time where we're making full chromosomes and make it all from scratch? Um, and so uh, the, 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 the questions really have become, um, can we read the genome before the embryo is implanted? Can we introduce genetic changes before making sperm and eggs? We talked about that, and the answer is yes, we can. Um, and therefore, can we read and write uh, information into the embryo by making important diagnostic decisions in the embryo before? So what, what have we decided? And this is where, this is the, this is the landscape that, that, uh, that, we're, that we're inhabiting right now. So, as you can imagine, the, um, the National Academy of Sciences um, and the National Academy of Medicine met, um, much like the Asilomar meeting, to make some decisions about what to do about all of this. Um, and um, I found this report e extraordinarily important. I would encourage everyone to read it. It's online. You can find it online. Um, but this is, of course, the, the bioethical report that came out of all of this. Um, I'm not going to ask you to read all of this. but. But it's important to reflect, because we've already taken this journey in this talk, that, um, that uh, three aspects were recognized. One is that the possibility, and I love this, this idea, that the possibility of diminishing the dignity of human beings is at risk as we move forward with these uh, technologies. 
the possibility of, of restricting respect for our variety is important. And finally, the possibility of a lack of humility. We might be, we might be engaging in things that, in, that have a lack of humility um, in moving forward. People who are in the field of bioethics know these principles very well, but it was probably one of the first times when um, I think the, the consequences for, for human future um, ha have been so stark. Um, the, uh, the, the limitations of the technologies were also recognized and have become recognized even in the last few weeks. Um, there have been three or four attempts in altering genes in humans. Um, whether these are safe, whether they only hit one gene, whether they can, by mistake, make other genetic alterations that we don't know of, uh, remain a question. Um, but I think it's fair to say that nothing in principle stops the field from moving forward. I think it's also fair to say that within the next 10 odd years that we will know the answer to whether we can definitively make changes in the human genome or certainly in the genomes of other organisms. I suspect in the next five years we will be able to quite definitively talk about making uh, genetically modified changes, deliberate changes in virtually uh, most organisms, particularly the ones that are involved in crop and food production in the, in, for humans. Um, so the National Academy um, uh, uh, proposed, and I'm going to, uh, this is going to be, the, this is going to stop, I'm going to stop here, and, and this is going to be the, the, the basis of, I think, the next few years of work. The National Academy made three recommendations for the possibility of human genetic changes. Many of us, I think including me, uh, had thought that the Academy would say we should stop, we should put a a cold, uh, we, should, we should go back to a colder moment, a moment of reflection uh, in which we say that we are not allowed to make changes in the human genome or particularly in human embryos. But it was, I was personally surprised um, that the Academy said in fact it would be per permissible to make changes in the human genome, uh, permanent changes in the human genome. Um, and these were the three principles. It's interesting that they uh, perhaps they're obvious, but in fact, I, uh, they're, they're remarkably concordant with the, with the triangle that I proposed in the, in the book, in the gene. Um, number one is that we make um, changes um, uh, only um, if the gene of interest or the gene that we're changing produces what they call extraordinary suffering. In fact, it's the same word that I used, uh, phrase I used in the book. Uh, that, in fact, extraordinary suffering is a criteria. Number two, that there's confidence that the gene, in fact, causes the disease, a causal confidence between the link between the gene and the disease, um, and that uh, no other justifiable alternative exists and there's no coercion. So um, the thought that I will leave you with um, as we enter the, the Q&A session is the thought which occurs, much must have occurred to all of you by, by now, which is who defines extraordinary suffering? Um, what is the limits of that definition? Is, um, is extreme shortness extraordinary suffering in societies where there's a uh, primacy placed on height? Um, what is the confidence line that we draw between the link between a gene and a disease? So let's take the example of BRCA1. I mean, I was giving a talk like this, um, and um, a woman came up to me after the talk. She had a family history of BRCA1, uh, of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, and she said she would love to eliminate the BRCA1 gene from her lineage. Um, seems like there's extraordinary suffering if you have breast or ovarian cancer, but perhaps there's also extraordinary suffering if you don't and you live under the shadow of having breast and ovarian cancer in your future? Should we, where do we draw that line? Um, what if we knew that there was only a 10 or 20% chance um, of having such a disease? I've often asked this question, you don't have to answer it, I've often asked the question to this audience, what if I were to tell you that you're, you've sequenced the genome of your unborn child and that child has a 5% risk of developing a lethal neurodegenerative disease? How many of you would choose not to have that child? Um, and what if I switch that number from 5% to 15%? Would it make a change? Um, and, and, and obviously, individuals draw that number in different ways. And finally, 
this idea of no justifiable alternative and no coercion um, sounds quite reasonable, sounds like a reasonable idea, but to remind ourselves that we live at the end of a history uh, where the, the nature of coercion and the, and the nature of what's justifiable um, are so linked in with our aspirations that what is coercive and what's not coercive often becomes um, fuzzy when it becomes real in the world. Um, the, the culture around eugenics uh, in the 1920s and 1930s was a coercive culture. It's the culture that took uh, people who were otherwise supposedly uh, liberal-minded, interested in, in, the, in the rights of individuals, um, and interested in, in understanding, the, understanding and, and, and sympathizing, empathizing with the plights of individuals, and yet the culture was coercive enough that a state mandate was passed to, um, to move them into, um, into, the, um, into penitentiaries. So um, someone asked me in, at the beginning of the talk, um, you know, are we ready to edit, what, what's your answer to the question, are we ready to edit, edit our genomes? The answer is technologically, we are getting closer and closer to doing that. Um, we have devised criteria um, to, to try to restrict our capacity to move uh, forward. Whether you agree or disagree with that criteria is a question that you need to take up individually. And just, just to remind ourselves that this cannot be a conversation that other people have. This is your genome. By definition, it is central to you. Uh, it is one of the most it is one of the things that is most central to who you are. Um, its stewardship um, is uh, part of what we have to have stewardship over. Um, and the fact that this is a conversation that will resonate very widely across uh, the next 10 years, I think, is uh, very evident to me and hopefully evident to everyone. So it's a moment, I think, to pause and ask the question, should there be deeper criteria? Should we stop? Um, should there be um, more than this um, that we devise in moving forward as uh, technologically we get more and more equipped to change our own uh, genetic information? So we will now have a conversation. Um, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll bring the, my, my book with me. Thank you.